So some of my objectives will review the mortality of all transplant patients in the ICU, look specifically at the mortality of ventilated and dialyzed patients, and then review the complications of transplant that most commonly lead to patients being admitted to the ICU. So more than 50,000 patients a year receive stem cell transplants. And of the 50,000 patients, 11 to 24% of them are transferred to the ICU. In-hospital mortality of patients who are transferred to the ICU ranges from 22 to 41%, depending on the study and the year of the study. One year overall survival is 11 to 21%. This is looking at ways to predict mortality for the stem cell transplant patients. In general medicine patients, scores such as the MPM2, SAPS2, and Apache2 are ways to look at the clinical factors on admission to the ICU and prediction of mortality in these patients. When you compare the actual mortality of our transplant patients compared to a general medicine patient, using these scores, it's actually much higher. And what are some of the reasons why the mortality is higher in our patients? So things that contribute specifically to transplant patients and increased mortality is patients who are intubated, dialyzed, have multi-organ system failure from either sepsis or graft-first-host disease, patients who have hepatic failure, GI bleed, high comorbidity index, patients with an increased length of ICU stay, and older age. Of the patients transferred to the ICU, 6 to 29% require mechanical ventilation. Looking specifically at these patients, between patients who are not mechanically ventilated and ventilated, the mortality is much higher in patients who are ventilated, with an ICU mortality of 18% and an in-hospital mortality of 15%, and a low one-year overall survival of 10%. This is looking at both ventilation and hemodialysis and shows that surprisingly, patients that are dialyzed actually have a higher odds ratio of dying than patients who are ventilated with an odds ratio of 8.7. So what are some of the reasons for ICU admissions? So first, we wanted to just touch base on infusion reactions because they can cause the need for emergent care but don't often send the patients actually to the ICU. So our first case, he's a 65-year-old gentleman. He has multiple myeloma. He's presenting for an auto-transplant. And during his stem cell infusion, he develops palpitations. Telemetry shows a new rapid irregular rhythm. And in terms of symptoms, he's felt well with the exception of nausea and fatigue. And he denies fevers, chills, rigors, chest pain, shortness of breath. His EKG is consistent with new atrial fibrillation. His past medical history is notable for hypertension and diabetes. His pre-transplant EF was 65%. He's on routine pre-transplant medicines with his ID prophylaxis and antiemetics. He is on amlodipine for his hypertension. And looking at his vital signs, he's 99.1, so afebrile. His blood pressure is normal at 130 over 82. His heart rate is 135 and irregular, and he's 97% in room air. So the differential diagnosis for new onset of atrial fibrillation in a transplant patient, in this patient, the most likely cause is DMSO toxicity, but could also be infection, volume overload, a new MI, or a thyroid or electrolyte disorder. The plan for this patient was an EKG, blood cultures, chest X-ray, and electrolytes. So DMSO toxicity, which we see quite frequently, Signs and symptoms are nausea, vomiting, rigors, back, chest pain, hypoxemia, changes in blood pressure or heart rate, arrhythmia, such as AFib or SVT, and then also can have hemolysis. You slow the rate of the infusion, you can use volume expansion with normal saline, and if you still remain hypotensive, if your symptoms are related to hypotension, then you can consider dopamine. The way to avoid this is limiting the DMSO to less than 40 ml per day, and if you see that you have a DMSO reaction with your first bag of cells, you can remove the DMSO before subsequent infusions. So other infusion reactions include fevers. So the fevers can be from a cytokine release, from an acute hemolytic reaction from the cells, from contamination of the cells, or from a coincidental infection that you're catching at the same time as the stem cell infusion. We usually treat this if, there's temp if the temperature is over 38 degrees Celsius with blood cultures, stem cell cultures, and antibiotics, focusing on gram-positive coverage in these patients as the most common contamination is a gram-positive skin flora. Bleeding is more common with bone marrow stem cell infusion, 
It presents as oozing around lines, hematuria, and if it's a head bleed, it can present with headaches or confusion or neuro changes. It's related to the 20,000 units of heparin in the unprocessed bone marrow, and the risk factors are recent surgery and severe thrombocytopenia. With that being said, most of our patients are thrombocytopenic at the time of the bone marrow infusion, and we don't see serious head bleeds. To prevent it, you can wash the marrow or use a different type of, anti or different type of anticoagulant. And if it occurs, and you're worried that the patient is having a serious bleed, such as a head bleed, you can stop the cells and give them protamine to reverse the heparin. Another uncommon but serious side effect would be stroke. So 10% of the population has a patent for Raymond Valley, and if cells are infused without a filter, aggregates can embolize. So it's important if you know the patient has a PFAO from their pre-transplant echo to put a filter on all their stem cell products. So this is just a, a quick overview of all the different complications after transplant based on the day after transplant. So either in the very immediate post-transplant period, day 30 to day 100, during the time period of acute GVH, or day after day 100 at the time of chronic GVH. I think you heard some about pulmonary complications, but we'll quickly review a few cases. So this gentleman was a 46-year-old man. He had myelofibrosis. He had a matched unrelated, unrelated donor myeloablative transplant with CYTBI conditioning. And he presents to the hospital on day 35 with low-grade fevers and shortness of breath. His fevers have been for two to three days. He has no other associated symptoms. And his shortness of breath is worse with activity. He feels as though he can't catch his breath walking up even a few steps. He has no cough, no chest pain, no orthopnea, swelling, or rashes, or myalgias. His past medical history is only notable for gallstones. His pre-transplant workup is remarkable for him both being CMV negative with his donor, so low risk for reactivation. His EF was normal. His DLCO was also normal. His immune suppression was TAC methotrexate. He's on ursodial, and then his ID prophylaxis is acyclovir and dapsone. His temperature is 100.1. His blood pressure is normal at 126 over 83. His pulse is 125. He's tachypnic at 24, and his SACs are 93% on room air. He has a scattered wheeze on exam, and he's tachycardic. So the differential diagnosis for him, I've highlighted some of the different topics we'll talk about, and Grafman syndrome. Infections such as PCP, pulmonary edema or pulmonary embolus, adapsone-induced eosinophilic pneumonitis, IPS, or DAH. He had a chest X-ray, an ABG, an EKG, culture scent, and then a chest CT. So specifically for pulmonary complications, since he was day 35, he sort of runs at the overlap time of less than 30 days and 30 to 100 days. So he could have a bacterial fungal infection or a viral or infection or PCP. He could still have some type of cardiac toxicity from his previous therapy and TBI. He could have IPS or DAH. So in Grafman syndrome, it occurs in 7 to 35% of stem cell transplant patients. The signs and symptoms are high fevers, rash, diarrhea, weight gain, and diffuse infiltrates. The median time of onset is 11 days, so making it quite unlikely in this patient. His, the risk factors are an auto over an allo transplant, so again, less likely. And it's usually thought to be released due to the release of cytokines by the neutrophils. The treatment, there's usually a prompt response to prednisone, a mig per kg per day, with a rapid taper. And this is just looking at one of our other patients' CAT scans, looking with the, the volume overload related to their engraftment syndrome. So what about diffuse alveolar hemorrhage? This is something we, something we don't see as frequently in the past several years. It's less than 5% of patients. It's shortness of breath, fevers, cough, hypoxemia, and unlike in general medicine patients, hemoptysis is actually quite rare. The onset is within 30 days of transplant. It's usually in older patients who receive total body irradiation and have concurrent graft-versus-host disease. It's related to injury to the cells and small blood vessels from the chemotherapy or radiation. On chest x-ray, it shows alveolar and interstitial infiltrates. CT is bilateral ground glass opacities. And the key is that in bronch and BAL, you actually have progressively bloodier return. The treatment, although debatable, is usually a gram of thiamedrol for three to five days, followed by a rapid taper. And there's some studies looking at factor 7A. 
The mortality despite treatment is still quite high at 50 to 70 percent. The key looking at this CAT scan, which is different than our patient's CAT scan, is although there's diffuse ground glass opacities, they're sparing of the periphery. IPS, so the incidence is about 10 percent. It's cough, shortness of breath, and low-grade fever, so consistent with the patient's presentation. The median onset is 21 to 65 days. It's older age, and at the studies that actually originally looked at IPS, it was originally older age over 55. Pre-transplant chemotherapy, so heavily pre-treated, total body irradiation, graft or post disease, and a CMV positive donor. So in this patient, although this ends up being the most likely syndrome, he didn't have very many risk factors. It's injury to the lung tissue because of cytokine release. And on diagnostic criteria, it's evidence of widespread alveolar injury and absence of active infection. And the treatment is steroids, usually one to two mg per kg per day, and Embryl. The mortality before Embryl was quite high at 75%, but with the use of Embryl has gone down to 40 to 50%. And this is actually our patient with his CAT scan, and he also has diffuse ground glass opacities, but he's not sparing periphery. I think you spoke before about bronchiolitis obliterans and poop. The key for this patient is it's unlikely to be bronchiolitis obliterans based on the timing of his presentation. He doesn't have the air trapping and bronchiectasis on the CAT scan. He doesn't have chronic graft disease. He did not get busulfan, although he did get methotrexate and peripheral blood stem cells. And the treatment of bronchiolitis obliterans, as you discussed, that steroids are usually ineffective with a very poor overall survival of 10%. Boop is in the differential for this man as it occurs from 1 to 12 months. It's usually granulation tissue within the ducts and the air sacs. It's shortness of breath, dry cough, fevers. The CT can have patchy airspace disease, but the lung biopsy shows organizing pneumonia. And the treatment of 80% of patients responds to steroids. So actually in him, when we were deciding on what it was, he never made it to biopsy. He just had rapid progression of his disease and died despite high doses of steroids. So what about cardiac complications after transplant? So these are much less common. This is a 28-year-old woman. She had high-risk AML. She was also admitted for a myeloablative transplant. She's now day minus one of conditioning with cytoxin and TBI, and she reports sudden onset of chest pain and shortness of breath. It's worse with deep breath, and it's better with sitting forward. Her nausea has been persistent, and she otherwise has no symptoms. She's on her pre-transplant medicines, her ID prophylaxis, her anti-emetics. Her heart rate is 150, but regular. Her blood pressure is 95 over 70, which is soft for her. She's normally 110 to over 90. Her respiratory rate is 22, and she's 90%, 92% on room air. She has coarse breast runs throughout, distant heart sounds. Her JVD, JV pressure is distended, and she has trace edema. So differential diagnosis of acute chest pain that's positional in nature is pericarditis, tamponade, unlikely an infarction because it's positional, an arrhythmia usually causes more palpitations than pain, and then other much lower in the differential would be infection, PE, or musculoskeletal disease. The plan was for a pulseless blood pressure check, chest x-ray, EKG, and echo, and cardiac enzymes. This was her chest x-ray showing cardiomegaly, and on her EKG, she has what looks like electrical alternance, which is pathognomonic for pericardial tamponade. So she has cytoxin-induced myopericarditis leading to cardiac tamponade. The incidence of myopericarditis is 2 to 5 percent, and actually progressing to tamponade is much lower at less than 1 percent. The classic signs are the Bex triad with elevated JV pressure, low blood pressures, distant heart sounds. Almost all patients are tachycardic, and most many have a elevated pulses pressure. It's usually within 48 hours of getting cytoxin, and it's related to the cumulative dose in patients with lymphoma at higher risk. On EKG, it's sinus tachycardia, low voltage in the precordial leads, and the electrical alternance, which we saw that she had. She has cardiomegaly on the chest X-ray, and then her echo did show an effusion with diastolic collapse of the right ventricle. So treatment in an emergent situation where myopericarditis causes actual tamponade often requires either pericardiocentesis or a pericardial window. 
In these patients, as I showed, she has low platelets, so the thought of giving her NSAIDs is less likely, is less satisfying because of her low platelets, and we don't want to put her at increased risk of bleeding further. Steroids have also been used, but are usually much better to prevent recurrent episodes of tamponade versus treating the original episode. So arrhythmias, during transplant you can see, we see all sorts of arrhythmias. It's usually in patients that actually have pre-existing heart disease or pre-existing arrhythmia, such as atrial fibrillation. It's related to either DMSO, cytoxin, volume overload, infection, cardiomyopathy, PE, or electrolyte abnormalities. A treatment is rhythm dependent, but if it's secondary to DMSO, as we discussed before, you can just slow the rate and hydrate. You don't necessarily need a beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker. So next, moving on to hepatic complications. So she's a 54-year-old woman. She was treated with Mylotarg immediate, or gemtuzumab immediately before transplant. She then went on to a myeloablative, matched unrelated donor transplant with side TBI conditioning. She presents with day, so she's in the hospital, and at day 18, her counts are coming back, and she now has abdominal pain and swelling. Her peritransplant course is complicated only by FNN and grade 4 mucositis. She now reports 8 out of 10, intermittent, right upper quadrant pain, feeling as though she's bloated, and new leg swelling. Her past medical history is only notable for migraines and hypertension. She has no history of any type of liver disorder. Her and her donor were O negative. She is at high risk for CMV reactivation because she was CMV positive and her donor was CMV negative. And her pre-transplant echo and DLCO were normal. Her immune suppression was TAC methotrexate and acyclovir. She's on acyclovir for ID prophylaxis and ursodiol for liver protection. She has no history of alcohol use. She has a temp of 100. Her blood pressure is normal. She's mildly tachycardic. Her stats are 94%, and her weight is up 5 kilograms over two days. She's distended with a fluid wave and is tender in the right upper quadrant with hepatomegaly, and she has 2 plus edema to the shins. Her labs are notable for a total bilirubin of 2.2 with a direct bilirubin of 1.6. So the differential diagnosis for new liver disease after transplant in a setting of possible low-grade temperature, venoocclusive disease, a viral or fungal infection, sepsis leading to a cholangitis type picture or cholangitis lenta, bud chiari or graft or host disease. Based on the timing after transplant, we sort of think about these different buckets of complications. So immediately post-transplant, we think more about cholangitis lenta and VOD, farther out after engraftment, acute GVHD, and then after day 30 is when we become more concerned about fulminant viral or fungal hepatitis. Venoocclusive disease, the incidence is anywhere between 5 and 15 percent. It's usually within the first 30 to 35 days, and she has all of the symptoms of hepatomegaly, right upper quadrant pain, jaundice, fluid retention, weight gain, and ascites. Risk factors for the patient is older age, they have a history of hepatitis, previous transplant, prior radiation, or as in her case, prior gemtuzumab. Allo is higher than auto, unrelated is higher than related, mismatched, and BUSI is higher than cytoxin TBI, and TAC-RAP is actually the highest risk at about 10 to 15 percent. It's related to the high doses of chemo and TBI damaging the endothelium. The diagnosis, we do an ultrasound, which can identify your hepatomegaly, your ascites, and your attenuated hepatic vein flow and reversal. But to actually make the diagnosis, you need to do a transjugular liver biopsy and wedge pressure. And the wedge pressure gradient is usually over 10, and it shows fibrosis and so on 3 damage. The key in these patients is to do a transjugular liver biopsy, one, because of the risk of bleeding with a direct CT-guided liver biopsy, but also because the wedge pressure is important. Prognosis for severe VOD with over 95% mortality before the addition of defibrotide, which now has complete response rates reported by Dr. Richardson between anywhere between 30 and 60%. And this is just looking at the endothelium with the clotting. So what about viral hepatitis? So viral hepatitis, we think of more farther out from transplant and not usually in the initial hospitalization. The viral infections that can cause fulminant hepatic failure, 
are HSV, VZV, adenovirus, and hep B. Viral infections that you can see come, patients come in with elevated LSTs, but not usually liver failure, are EBV, CMV, hep C, HHV6, and enterovirus. Adenovirus rarely presents with hepatitis alone and is usually associated with pulmonary, respiratory, renal, bladder, or GI symptoms such as diarrhea. And the prompt treatment with sodofavir is most effective, although keeping in mind that sometimes patients have renal toxicity also, sodofavir is renally toxic. Hep B, it may develop during immune reconstitution, and we've seen patients recently die of Hep B reactivation, usually between day 30 and day 60, and it can be prevented with prophylactic antivirals throughout their therapy. HSV and VZV causing hepatitis is quite rare, with less than 2% of patients undergoing transplant. It's usually very late post-transplant and presents with coagulopathy, encephalopathy, and transaminases over 5,000. And it's fatal in the majority of cases despite therapy. This is just looking at the pathology of the different etiologies of hepatic infection, so either fungal, CMV, VZV, adeno, or EBV. So lastly, we'll talk about neurologic complications. So MM was a 60-year-old woman. She's day 34. She had a reduced intensity matched unrelated donor transplant for AML, and she's brought to the local ED by her husband for headaches and confusion. She was doing okay at home until two days ago when she first developed headaches. She describes them as throughout her head and throbbing. The headaches have gone from 2 to 3 out of 10 to up to 8 out of 10, and they're not associated with vision changes or photophobia. She's had mild nausea, but that's been persistent, and no weakness or focal neurologic changes. Her past medical history is only notable for hypertension and diabetes, and her immune suppression, which are highlighted, are tacrolimus and serolimus. She has no tobacco or alcohol use. She's afebrile. Her blood pressure, which was also another key in her presentation, was 170 over 105. Her pulse is 78, and her stats were 97% on room air. She does have some path pointing and difficulty with rapid alternating movements on the right, but her short-term memory and attenuation are okay, and it's otherwise non-focal. So differential diagnosis of our patients after transplant, there are different types of confusion or headaches or neurologic complications are metabolic encephalopathy, specific drug toxicities, press, infections, seizures, or CVAs. She had a head CT without contrast to rule out bleed, which was negative, and had an MRI with gadolinium, and we we're considering an LP. So toxic metabolic encephalopathy is the most common thing that you'll see, see and rarely actually needs the patient to go to the unit. It's a change in mental status, confusion, seizures, delirium, inattentiveness. The onset's usually within the first two months and often when they're initially in the hospital. Other causes besides the medications that are on this list are hypercarbia, electrolyte abnormalities, liver or renal failure, or sometimes even infection. Specific drugs that we use in transplant that can cause neurotoxicity are the calcineurin inhibitors, the cyclos so cyclosporin and tacrolimus, they can cause tremors, headaches, and hallucination, often related to dose level, but it, cannot, it can happen at any level. Cortical blindness, seizures, encephalopathy, generalized cerebellar dysfunction, and can even progress to quadriplegia. High-dose sulfan has a 10% risk of seizures if without use without prophylaxis. And the reason we often use Keppra over Dilantin is because Dilantin is also metabolized by the CYP450, as is busulfan, so it can interact with the levels. And then steroids, as we all know, can cause both a psychosis and delirium requiring therapy with things such as Zyprexa or Seroquel. So what about press? So this is what the patient actually, the diagnosis ended up being. So posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome, the incidence is 1 to 3%. Signs and symptoms are hypertension that's refractory, insidious onset of headaches, confusion, visual changes, and eventually seizures. The risk factors are the combination, it can be calcineurin inhibitors alone, but the combination of calcineurin inhibitors and serolimus increases your risk. And graft-first host disease. It's a sudden increase in blood pressure that leads to hyperperfusion of the brain and cerebral swelling, and is also related to damage to endothelium, which occurs more likely with RAP, in addition to the TAC. We'll look at her MRI, but it's white matter edema on the posterior circulation, 
So treatment is to stop the calcium neuron inhibitor and aggressively but control the blood pressure. And the prognosis is to, with stopping the calcium neuron inhibitor, in the majority of cases are reversible, usually in a few days. So this is actually her CAT scan, which highlights the edema in the, in the posterior circulation. So lastly, we'll just talk quick, briefly about CNS infections. Although bacterial in the general population is a little more common, we rarely see bacterial infections unless it's in a cardio and chronically immunosuppressed patient. Aspergillus, zygomycosides such as mucor, viral infections are more commonly things the things we see in transplant, such as HHV6, CMB, HSV, BCV, and then more rarely adeno, JC, and then EBV, or toxoplasma in patients that are toxo positive pre transplant. So CNS aspergillosis, the incidence is low and is usually 1 to 3 percent. It's usually a later complication at about four months. And it usually, just based on looking even at the scan, presents with focal symptoms. So stroke-like symptoms, headaches, or focal symptoms or seizures. The MRI is usually showing a lesion associated with edema, hemorrhage, infarction, and ring enhancement. The risk factors, depending on, on the time post-transplant or age, being mismatched, graft resource disease or CMV, and the treatment is voriconazole, plus or minus a neurosurgical procedure if the lesion is able to get to by surgery. The survival rates with both surgery and voriconazole are about 20%. So what about HHV6 encephalitis, something we often talk about at our institution, a setting involved the cord transplant. So the incidence, as you can see, is much higher in cord transplants at 10 to 15% versus 1 to 4% in regular aloes. The onset is usually during their initial admission, 20 to 30 days post-transplant. The symptoms are often amnesia, seizures, confusion, behavioral changes, low, actually low temperature, so fevers are less commonly seen with HHV6. It's often temperatures more around 94 or 95. And on diagnosis, the MRI shows hyperintense T2 lesions in the medial and temporal lobes. And the CSF has a PCR that's positive for HHV6 and often high protein. As I discussed, cords are, high, are a risk factor, mismatch transplants, and also the presence of graft versus host disease. Treatment, you need phosgranate promptly introduced into these patients. Survival is about 50% in cords, but higher in myeloblative transplants at about 60 to 70%. But unfortunately, based on how late we pick it up, 80% of the patients already have permanent cognitive defects that are not recoverable. So PML is re not related to JC virus. It's quite rare. Is less than 1% of the patients. It's usually greater than six months after transplant. And it's associated with motor deficits, limb or gait ataxia, and visual changes, and also changes in personality. The MRI shows this increased signal in the periventricular subcortical white matter. The CSF is a PCR positive for JC virus, and often patients require a brain biopsy. The only treatment is to stop immune suppression, and it's usually progressive and often fatal. So even there have been therapies such as cytarabine and other therapies that they've tried, and even despite those therapies, it's fatal. So toxoplasma, which we don't, it, depending on what region you live in and the, how common it is, the incidence is up to 1.4%. It's often within the first month. It's focal neurologic symptoms, and the MRI usually has multiple enhancing lesions, and the CSF, again, is positive for toxoplasma. The treatment is paramethamine, sulfadiazine, and folinic acid. And the prognosis, about 40% of, up to 40% of the patients have a response. Any questions? 